are really, really excited to have both Rita Sorenin, CEO um, and president of the Dave Thomas Foundation, along with Jill Krumbacher, Senior Vice President of Marketing and Development. Um, Jill, I got a witness to you after our session yesterday on the nonprofit show. Um, Jarrett Ransom and I were like, we need to meet up for coffee or brunch, whatever, because we had so many things to talk about and reflect on what we learned from you. Oh, um, okay. Because we're just amazed that your organization can take two pieces and put them together the way you all do. And so uh, it's very, very interesting. And so we're delighted to have the two of you back to talk about how you harness growth and all of the things that can change with, I would dare say, a, a successful nonprofit, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to get into that because this is going to be a really robust conversation. Again, if we haven't met, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. My trusty sidekick, Jarrett Ransom, has the day off. We'll be joined with her shortly. Again, this is a very unique situation. This is one of the rare nonprofit power weeks we have throughout the year. We only have a handful of them. And we want to thank our sponsors who make this possible. Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Be Generous, Fundraising Academy at National University, Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and the Nonprofit Nerd. If you have missed any of our nearly 700 episodes, or you want to share this nonprofit power week, you can do so very easily. Find us on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, YouTube, and Vimeo. And you can also queue us up where you like to consume your podcasts. Because for this last year, we have been also podcasting all of our episodes. Okay, Rita Sorenen, thank you ever so much for being with us. Why does this make why is this month really, really busy for you? Oh, listen, it's my pleasure to be here, first of all. I love, I adore being with both of you. Good. And this is a very special month uh, for the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption and anybody that works in the world of adoption. Um, it's National Adoption Month, and Saturday is National Adoption Day. Yes. So it gives us an opportunity, although we talk about these topics all year long, it gives us an opportunity to really elevate the conversation, the messaging, the engagement, so that more and more people can join us in this quest. Yeah. You know, Jill Krumbacher, I'm delighted to have you back on. And I think of this Saturday coming up, I think of like all these images that we're going to see from courtrooms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And your team must be involved with that in showing these, these new families being created before our eyes. That's correct. We have a whole website de dedicated uh, to National Adoption Day. Uh, yeah. We collect stories. Um, and yeah, we, we help tell those stories. Um, sometimes it's in a lot of times it's in the courtroom. A lot of times it's community celebrations. Mm -hmm. um, and and often um, families sort of celebrate this day. Right. And uh, so a lot plays out on social media. So it's just another great opportunity for us to share about yeah. the families formed through adoption. You know, I've got to believe if you're in the um, judicial branch and you get to be a part of this from the technical side, I'm I'm going to use the word technical side, but mm -hmm. from that judicial side, it must be like the best day of your career because it's such a tough business. And then to have all this uh, must be really, I, I mean, just it must carry you through the rest of the year, right? So It's so true. It's so true. I was at an event yesterday here in Columbus, Ohio, and the probate judge that stood up and was facilitating those adoptions literally said, this is my favorite day of the year when I work in this court. I get it. And I mean, just for me to witness it, you know, as a just a general consumer of news, it's powerful. So to be there, amazing. Well, ladies, let's dig into this because we're talking about managing a growing organization, um, I would say that that's a result of success for the most part. But talk about the shift in culture. I mean, you are an organization that was founded through the vision of a single individual who had the resources and the foresight to navigate 
this bigger discussion. We've said this before. I can't imagine that he would have ever, ever dreamt that you would be able to achieve the things that you've been able to achieve. And that's got to be a shift in culture in itself. How does that look to you, Rita? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And particularly the last five years or so, look, we've grown significantly. Um, we've more than doubled our staff. When I started a million years ago, we were a staff of about five. We're a staff of more than almost more than 60 now. So just that piece alone, right. One, how do we maintain the legacy under which we were founded, making sure that everybody that comes in the door, whether they're 21 years old or 60 years old, understands who Dave Thomas was, what the impetus behind this is, what our partnership with the Wendy system is. So that piece alone um, can be a shift in culture when you get farther and farther away from um, the person who founded the organization. But just some of those other shifts, there are changing dynamics when you grow from an organization of 10 or 15 people to 60 people that are across the board from policies and procedures to um, uh, age differences to belief differences and accommodating all of those things so that people feel empowered and part of the whole, but can maintain their individuality too. It's, it's, it, it, there's work to be done in, in, in defining and maintaining and amending that culture as appropriate. You know, Jill, you straddle such a fascinating thing, and that is you lead not only development, but you lead marketing. When we talk about a shift of culture, I've got to ask you, are you seeing demographic or age shifts with between people that are in, you know, the marketing, which tend to be younger, and then development, and they tend to be older? Do you ever see that there's some cultural issues that way? Yeah, that's really interesting. It is true. A lot of our hires, even in the past couple of years in marketing, are younger, um, our development team, you know, you often don't come out of college and say, I want to be a fundraiser and launch right into fundraising. <laughs> you, you don't? No, <laughs> you usually fall into it yeah. for some other way. So it's often, and it's not really an entry level role to go sit in front of a donor, right? Yeah. Um, that takes some time. And so for sure, I do think um, that difference in experience level and then what comes with that often age backgrounds um, can play out a little bit culturally, just what um, teams want to do, what they expect. You know, a lot of the younger folks, um, maybe they don't have family responsibilities yet and they want to go start a volleyball team and they, or they want to go to lunch a lot or they want, you know, those kinds of things. And you know, the staff that might be further along, maybe they have families and they just want to get in, get their work done and get home and spend time with family. Right. And so um, those kind of cultural things that we found that there's just differences, even in those kinds of preferences, like what do you want your work family to be? How much time do you want to spend with them? Those kinds of things certainly play out. You know, it's, it's interesting to me too, because on top of all this, you have such a strong founder story, but yet Every year we move away from that, people might know the Wendy's brand driving down the street, um, but they don't think like I do of, you know, all those commercials where Dave Thomas was the spokesman. And so how do you, you know, you, you mentioned Rita in the beginning, aligning what that history is to the new hires and the existing, but the number of people that knew him or could recognize him are getting fewer and fewer, right? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Absolutely true. And so it's our job to make sure we are the Dave Thomas Foundation Production, that there's meaning behind that name. Yeah. Part of that is the Thomas family still sits on the board of trustees. So we keep it at a governance level. Um, we And that includes Wendy Thomas, for whom the, the brand is named. And so we, as we can, we include her in conversations with staff or invite her to meetings, make sure that she can firsthand tell that story. But part of the onboarding process is making sure that people remember, or if they don't remember, know who this man is and why, what that link to the foundation is. It's not just that he created a foundation in his name. He created it because it was personal to him because it's about adoption. And so that provides that glue, but it's on, I think, leadership's shoulders to make sure that that it's woven throughout all that we, that we do it. Particularly, you know, for example, this week, Wendy's is celebrating Founders Week. The first Wendy's restaurant was November 15th, 1969. So it's a parallel between the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption National Adoption Month, 
And Wendy's Founders Week, that gives us another in in linking these two, not just brands, but Dave Thomas to what we do for the staff and for other people that are interested in who we are. Wow, it's real. It's an interesting thing. Now, I I, I got to ask this, Jill, in terms of talking about culture before we move on, and because you manage two incredibly different types of teams w- rowing in the same direction, did all of your cultural aspects and the things that you do to keep your team together completely shift because of COVID and working from anywhere? Oh, yes, absolutely. We all had to get up to speed with technology. Even after we came back in the building, we um, decided to allow some remaining flexibility. So a certain number of days we want people to be in the office and a certain number of days um, they can opt to, to work from home. And so when we have department meetings, now I've got to learn how to Zoom some people in, have some people in person. How do we all see each other meeting in person and not be classroom style against how do the people that are physically there all see each other and bring people in from home and so you know learning technology getting up to speed it is very involved in our day-to-day now like in every meeting like it help this isn't working you know we're calling on them so much more but um that was a that was a big shift it's not as simple as just all gathering in one room we learned how to be together totally not together and now we're learning how to be a mix Right. Um, some here and some there. So, so the learning, it just continues. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, right before the pandemic or as the pandemic was starting, you had already moved into new offices as well, right? So is that true? Am I remembering that? We had purchased a building, but we hadn't moved in yet. We had moved into separate offices because we were growing. So we were already split as a team and we were so looking forward to getting into the new building. And being together and then boom, the pandemic hit. So that cultural issue was hitting us before as a divided team, but the physically divided. And how do we how do we bring people together? Wow. Well, yeah, I mean that that in itself, um, that type of move is is such a cultural shift in many ways. I, I also want to talk to you about as you're growing and you're experiencing dare I say, growing pangs or the things that go on, how have you been able to look internally and understand um, who the right people on the bus are, as they say, and how have you navigated that? Because that's a dicey thing as well. Um, Rita, go ahead and, and let me start with you. Have you been looking around throughout this growth phase and tapping people on the shoulder? What's your approach been? Everybody... Or I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. It, it, it's been a combination of both because what we do want to do is recognize the talent that we have. And we have an incredibly talented staff. Mm-hmm. When we were small, there weren't a lot of promotion opportunities. We could change a title, but and maybe yeah. you know, give a little bit more pay, but there wasn't really any greater responsibility other than the day-to-day job. They weren't managing more people or, or learning those kinds of skills. But as we grew, we wanted to tap into that. And we've developed a, a fairly robust system of, not only annual review that everyone has to do and recognizing what people do, but talent identification as well is part of that. So help us understand, um, in addition to what we see every day, what are your skills? What are your aspirations for growth? Where would you like to go in this organization? How can we provide support to help you get into that, perhaps a different position or a management position? We can't guarantee it, but let's all be open about it and talk about it. So we've developed a pretty... I think, rigorous process of identifying talent and promoting talent within when we can. And if it's not there, then certainly looking outside of the organization. Right. Now, Jill, you said something fascinating. And that was most people don't like jump out off campus with that diploma and say, I'm going to be a fundraiser, (laughs) (laughs) which I thought was hilarious because I hadn't ever really thought of it in those terms. Um, But you're right. And we have now more and more opportunities across this country to get a, a higher degree ed, uh, higher ed degree in nonprofit management yep. and philanthropic studies uh, more than ever. But yep. how do you answer that same question? I mean, looking and finding fundraisers, um, what does that look like for you? Right. Well, you know, I think... Um, 
we've got a couple different channels of fundraising. And so we're looking for different things amongst those fundraisers. So um, for the most part, our fundraisers that are looking to grow our mass sort of public support tend to do come from other nonprofits. Yeah. Again, it's usually not an entry level role. So they've learned something about um, fundraising. There's usually a transition between um, a chapter organization or, you know, we're a national headquarters. And so there's a different yeah. level, a different game there. You're not just doing local fundraising, you're, you're doing it across the country. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have a fairly uh, significant team that works with our corporate partners. Right. And the largest of, of which, of course, is Wendy's. And we've really found that the most successful people there look different than the successful people in our mass public public fundraising role. And typically they are people who come from corporate environments. They might come from sales environments, business development. Mm -hmm. um, they're people who stand up and give presentations. They know how to talk to a corporate audience. And so I think you're looking for different things depending upon who you're fundraising from. And we really tried to fill some of those um, corporate positions with traditional fundraising folks. And it wasn't a great fit. Um, and we, you know, we really learned in that sense that um, if, if we can bring someone in who knows how to talk to a corporate audience, we can teach them the fundraising basics versus, right. you know, the mass public, you really need to understand fundraising basics to work in that. So we've got a diff couple different channels going on. That's kind of how we've, how we've navigated. Um, and luckily we've been able to keep our, our, uh, slots full. <laughs> we haven't had a lot of turnover, so that's a blessing. Good. You know, so then go to that other side of your brain with the marketing side with the pressure of digital and certainly how we've ramped up uh, to a degree that I can't even believe because of the pandemic that kind of takes a younger employee because somebody who's come through that study of digital communications, are you finding that that's pushing down that, that age group on that type of employee? You know, I think, I think it has to a degree. And so we've certainly brought in internal staff. Another decision for us though has been, when do we hire externally? When do we hire agency support? And I understand that not every nonprofit has that the benefit of being able to do that. Yeah. I, I get that that can be an expensive investment, but when you're talking about technology and some things change so rapidly that you exit college, you're out three years and now you're outdated. Right. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. um, Keeping up with that, we've found in some instances, we need agency support where all they're doing is this all day long for different clients, mm -hmm. and they're keeping up with all those technology changes. I mean, we have partners where they have staff where all they do all day long is make sure that our emails are deliverable. And if they're not being delivered, why aren't they being delivered? We notice they're not being delivered in AOL. They are in G Gmail, and they're in there figuring out why. We can't our staff could never keep up with the how-to of that. We could never have a staff large enough to do that. So it's it's a balance. Yes, it brings in younger, but also recognizing sometimes um, we can't, even the young folks can't, can't keep up. It, it, the technology just changes so fast that we've had to decide to go external on a few things. So Rita, that, that leads me to another question, which is kind of interesting. It's like, when you started out, all hands on deck, you had your five go-to people and everybody's working hard. How did you mentally and economically make that shift to say, okay, I'm crying, uncle, I need the out outside help? Because that's a growth issue that I see with leadership. It's really hard. And sometimes your board can't understand that as well. Have you seen that in the trajectory? Oh, we have. We have, and again, particularly over the last decade, I would say. Mm -hmm. And it started, as we talked about earlier in the week, with research. We can't do our own internal research. You have to have an, an external independent source for the kind of research we were looking at. So that showed us that, yes, we could find the resources for it. It gave validity to the programs we did. It helped uh, attract other resources. And so I think we were able to uh, um, parallel that to the other areas of the organization. Look, we have two parallel missions here, not only to move children out of uh, foster care and into adoptive homes, but how do we raise awareness? And we can only raise awareness by doing the best possible job with marketing, with fundraising, with communications, with digital communications. So and there are times when I've said, wow, 
wait a minute, let's back down on this external source. You know, maybe we could do that internally, but it's, so it's a constant tug and pull of, do yeah. we need to spend this kind of money in order to get this job done? But what Jill and her team do excellently is provide the support for, here's why we need this. Here's what it will cost. Here's the return on investment. Mm -hmm. And and then we see that and, and can continue to grow it. So, but it is, it absolutely is a tug and pull. Should we use this for this budget or should we use it for this budget? Can we have internally that same resource or do we really need to stay external? Yeah, it's a, it's such an interesting question. And I think it is going to only increase. I mean, this, the speed with which um, we're ad adopting new technology, I mean, just the AI component of things, it, it's just fascinating. And so that's like a whole nother, that's like a whole nother week <laughs> of discussion. You know, um, I'm really interested in this. I keep thinking about you, Rita, with your five soldiers ready to go. <laughs> and then you're like, you're up to 60 and now it's a legion. And <laughs> you got to make some things go into process. I mean, yeah. people can't just like come into your office and plop down and ask what you're cooking for dinner, right? I mean, how have you explored process, but then also... I want to ask Jill to follow up. How have you communicated what the new process is? Yeah, and the good news is I think we've always been innovators at heart. It's it's who we are at the core. And so we haven't been afraid to test, poke, prod, and find out what the best process is. But I can give a specific example that Jill can speak to much better. There came a point not so long ago where so many projects were on so many different people's tables, but they all had interactions in those projects that we finally had to move to a project management system. Right? We were handling that as individuals. We needed a, a, a platform that allowed that to become much more efficient. So by moving to something like that and continuing to look, well, where do we need that kind of different process with with perhaps the finance team or with, with the, uh, the legal team? You know, constantly looking at what will make us as efficient as possible. We want every dollar to be used as effectively and efficiently as possible. But we also don't want to overwhelm staff and teams uh, who think in, at the end of the day, I've got 15 things on my checklist that didn't even happen when right. there is probably a process or a platform that could help that mm -hmm. go better. Mm -hmm. So then Jill, internally, you're communicating to your teams and you're trying to get a cultural shift, a technological shift, a mental shift, and in almost an intellectual shift, um, as the grand communicator, a lot of this must come back to you, right? H how do you do this? Sure. So I think, you know, I think what usually makes it obvious to us eventually that we need a process change is there's a problem. Like you can feel yeah. a problem. <laughs> And, 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 you know, we can sit and talk about it now. Like it was, oh, this is great. Oh yeah, it was clear to go here. No, I mean, I think I, how it usually plays out is something's not working. Somebody, mm -hmm. something's feeling overwhelmed or deadlines are being missed or my day feels chaotic and I cannot keep up or, you know, whatever it is. And then you start to try to find the solution to that problem and you find your way through it until you find it and it works. So I think when you're trying to communicate a process change, we, we communicated, here's the problem we're having. Do you all feel it? Are you feeling this? Yes, I'm feeling this. Okay, we're going to change this process to help get, try to get rid of this problem. We're hopeful that this will alleviate all of these problems for you. Um, and for all of us, and I think that's the way we communicated and people are much more receptive to, we're not just doing it to make your, you know, another system you have to learn or something like that. We're doing this for a reason because, you know, we're hitting a wall, we're struggling with something and we need to find a solution and we're hopeful that this is the solution. So get on board with us and hopefully it'll pay off for all of us. Mm -hmm. That's how we, that's how we communicated. And it's worked really well. I think our teams now where we've had process changes, technology changes, project management systems, everyone's really grateful for it mm -hmm. now. <laughs> you know, now, well, that's the thing I, I find too, especially when you have any interface with um, a board to a funder, nonprofits are really, really reticent to say, I'm having a problem. 
it seems like you're weak or it seems like, mm-hmm. you know, you can't do your job or, or whatever. And so to navigate through, uh, um, to recognize problem, navigate through it and then create a whole new dynamic um, is not for the faint of heart, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but ultimately it's a part of growth. Another piece of growth, which I, I want to kind of end our time together on is the issue of equity and inclusion. Um, this is an interesting piece because you have been so Wendy uh, centric and your, your teams and everything, you know, like when we've talked about your board coming directly from that part, um, not that they're not diverse, but they're from a certain group. How have you opened this up or had those discussions? Is it ongoing? What are your, what are some of your thoughts on this, Rita? The, the communication is ongoing. The discussions are ongoing. The, the tactics are very specific. During the pandemic, we all were kind of slapped in the face with the recognition that none of us, none of us across the country were doing enough with racial equity and inclusion issues. Um, and so we started very quickly with um, putting the staff, and we were still fully remote, but putting the staff through an intensive 30-hour training with an outside consultant on racial equity, history of racial equity, all of those issues that we needed to begin to very much grapple with. We then created an internal equity team that's made up of staff um, so that we can explore all the areas of the foundation from at equal pay to um, attracting uh, staff, diverse staff to, you know, all those issues that that we we were conscious of, but we weren't being very proactive about. We are now very proactive and accountable for uh, making sure that we are an organization that someone from the outside could look at and say they're very much committed to racial equity, social justice. Look, we're in a system where the overrepresentation of particularly Black children in the child welfare system is profound. So we can't any longer have a blind eye to that or not know if we're contributing negatively to it or if we're contributing positively to making change. So it started internally. We'll continue that externally and the board is all in on that as well. Okay, so then Jill, I got to ask the next level of that question. And again, we don't have a lot of time, but did that inform changes with your marketing and communications? Oh, absolutely. Um, All of our areas of our external communication and internal, but external communication were one of the things that we watched within the committee. So we set up a number of goals and those goals were internal goals um, and external goals. Um, You know, we, we wanted to make sure that employees here felt that you know, equity and inclusion within our walls, but then we also want to defect the child welfare system, knowing that we have a voice in it. Part of that is making sure that all of our external communications are using that lens. And so we're still going through a process of auditing all of our materials, all the way that we talk about everything. Um, And, you know, it's a um, company-wide cross-department um, sort of employee-led group of people that are taking the magnifying glass, again, getting external help um, when necessary of what is the right way to talk about these things and what isn't and what words should we stay away from, what should we use, all of that. So it is an ongoing, it's not like we just looked at it and it's fixed. Um, you know, it takes a while to go through with all of that. But I think the important thing is that we're committed to the long haul of staying with it and continually auditing ourselves um, and and trying to do better. Well, you know, this is a fascinating conversation because I would have never thought that that would have been something that would be a part of growth and understanding, Mm -hmm. um, you know, the wellness of an organization, but it makes abundant sense. And it is not only the right thing to do, but it's structurally, uh, the right thing to do for you, the health of the organization, right? So it's really been interesting to hear all these different uh, components. Again, Rita L. Sornan, President and CEO of the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption has been with us, as well as Jill Krumbacher, Senior Vice President of Marketing and Development, everybody, and <laughs> Development. It's just fascinating to us. Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. Really cool. I love to see your energy. I love to see how the two of you lead and and work together. It's just been, it's been fascinating for us. And um, this this is not the only conversation we've had. Um, It still remains extremely fascinating to both 
uh, Jarrett and I. And so to have you all on for Nonprofit Power Week has just been amazing. And it will continue through tomorrow. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. We'll have Jarrett Ransom back with us shortly, the nonprofit nerd. Again, our thanks and, and tremendous gratitude to our sponsors who allow us to have the Nonprofit Power Week. And I will mention this without any um, expectation or management of what we talk about. We talk, you know, we tell them we're, that we're going to do this, but they never uh, impose any parameters on us. And and that's pretty powerful. Uh, Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Be Generous, Fundraising Academy at National University, of course, the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and the Nonprofit Nerd. Again, these are the folks that have joined with us for this amazing week. Okay, ladies, I know you have a lot to do, so we're going to let you go, but we'll be back together again tomorrow for our ask and answer. We've had some really interesting questions come through this week that you've spurned. And so it'll be fun to, to have those conversations. And again, thank you for all you do across our country and in into Canada. Um, this is, I know, a very, very intense time for you. And we are delighted that you would share that time and wisdom with us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, everybody, we like to remind ourselves, our viewers, our listeners, our sponsors, our guests to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone.